Thank you. Kia ora, everyone. Happy Matariki. Uh, and thanks again, Charlotte, for the introduction. Um, so you've seen the title slide for a while. Um, I just, before I, I go further, I just want to um, acknowledge that this, this work was developed by lots of people over the years. Um, I'm not going to name everybody, but there's a few important people who I should mention. Uh, Michael Townsend, who worked with me at NIWA for a number of years. He's now at Waikato Regional Council, has been instrumental in this work. And also I'd like to acknowledge my um, co-authors and collaborators, uh, Emily Douglas, Vera Ruins, Fabrice Stevenson, um, Conrad Pilditch, and um, Donna Clark as well. So this work has, has, has been ongoing for a while, and a lot of it um, was really um, funded by the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge in Project 2.1.3. So. What I'm basically going to do today um, is I'm first going to define what ecosystem services are and discuss why they're relevant to the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge and its mission. Um, and then I'm also going to discuss why really we need to measure and map ecosystem services. Um, and then I'm going to talk about sort of three um, streams of work. Um, not related to each other, but three um, consistent themes of work that we completed as part of phase one of this, uh, of this project 2.1.3. And as Charlotte mentioned, I'll take questions um, at the end. Just be aware that I can't see you and I can't see the comment bar. So if you're waving, waving your hand or writing comments, I won't see them until the end. Um, so I'm not ignoring you, but that's just uh, the, way, the way it is. So, uh, so getting on with the talk now. So essentially uh, ecosystem services really are about getting people to understand the benefits of having healthy and functioning ecosystems. And it's really about understanding the links between what biodiversity does and what people really care about. So, oops. Um, there's, it's really important to know the nitty gritty details about some of the scientific processes, these biophysical processes that occur, uh, but it's also equally important to link what we know um, scientifically about these detailed processes. We need to link that to functions and to services and ultimately through to what people really care about, um, explaining how it benefits humanity and relates to the values that humans hold about the marine environment. So really this ecosystem services is, is a way of linking together the kind of um, hardcore biophysical science with uh, a more holistic understanding of uh, ecosystem values and what people care about. So one of the overarching goals of the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge is really to better incorporate environmental, social, and cultural values into decision making, rather than making it always about um, economic bottom lines as, as the main driver. And really true ecosystem-based management will maintain a, a wide variety of uses in the marine space. Um, and we really need to recognize the role of biodiversity in, in maintaining a, a, a number of these key life supporting ecosystem functions. So ecosystems don't really need managing. We need to manage what we humans put into the marine environment and do to the marine environment. But we need to recognize that coastal marine spaces are, are multi-use systems um, and there are multiple benefits that we get from them. So just as an example uh, about what ecosystem services are. So these are ecosystem services that are associated with bivalve shellfish. So this uh, was, this information is compiled by Vera Lu Rulins, who is a PhD student who was supported by the project. Um, and she basically went through the literature and um, found a list of ecosystem services that were, are associated with bivalve shellfish. So for example, we know that shellfish provide food, so mussels and oysters and clams, um, things like that, scallops, they provide food, but also crushed shell material is um, used in roading. Um, it's also added to uh, buffer the pH of soils on farms. We know that these bivalves um, can filter out um, particles from the water so they can 
um, contribute to water clarity. They can sequester carbon. They can remove, remove um, pollutants such as heavy metal contaminants. So I'm not going to go through the whole, whole list here. You can see them. Um, I guess one thing about Vera's literature review that sort of identified that coastal, uh, sorry, that um, cultural values are generally underrepresented in, in the scientific literature. Um, and that's, so we know, for example, in New Zealand, that um, there's a huge non-monetary values associated with shellfish in terms of um, kai moana. Um, hapu and iwi go out and collect local kai moana and use it uh, to feed their guests at the marae. So it's a very culturally important um, uh, service in New Zealand that, that are provided by these bivalve shellfish. And we need to recognize that it's not picked up well in the literature. They're very hard to quantify um, those services. So I guess another point is that using ecosystem services in management requires a little bit more than just saying, well, we've got a clump of mussels here. So therefore that whole list of services that you saw on the previous page, um, we can just tick those off. It's really not about that. We have to recognize that you may need a patch of shellfish that's a few hectares in size and you need had to have high numbers of shellfish per meter squared in order to have a measurable impact on water clarity, for example, or, or um, carbon sequestration or what have you. Um, it's also very difficult to safeguard these types of ecosystem services until we really know where they're being generated and in what quantities. So we need to kind of um, quantify these ecosystem services um, and we can do that directly in some cases or with proxies or models and others, but we need to quantify them and map their locations so that we can um, better use ecosystem services as, as a tool in marine management. We need to convert it from sort of this useful concept to a more practical tool. And that's really what one of the goals of the project was about. So now I'm going to turn to some of these themes of the research that we've, we've done over the past few years. So one of the services we are interested in is biogenic habitat structure, which is a service related to the provi provision of refuge habitat for juvenile fish and invertebrates. So um, basically what biogenic habitat structure means, it's biologically generated habitat so um, plants and animals will attach to the sea floor, but they'll grow up vertically into the water column. They'll create sort of this three-dimensional vertical structure and relief away from the seabed habitats. And they create a lot of nooks and crannies, little hiding places that act as settlement sites for a whole variety of juvenile fish and invertebrates. And it relates to some of the values we hold about the marine environment particularly because it increases um, populations of things like snapper and, and scallops. An another kind of thing to recognize about biogenic habitat is that it, it is susceptible to um, various types of disturbances that we have in the marine environment. For example, bottom trawling um, or the loading of sediments from land into the sea, which can smother some of these um, organisms or shade out the light that they need to grow. So basically to quantify and, and map this ecosystem service that um, is related to um, biogenic habitat or biogenic structure, um, we, we used a, a rules-based approach. Now, one of the reasons we call it the ecosystem principles approach. So one of the reasons we use a rules-based approach rather than a, than a database approach is that we effectively don't really know where the biogenic habitat structure is because we can't see through all that water. It's really difficult, especially at the scale of 14,000 square kilometers to know what's living on the seabed. So there's very little biological data at this scale. That we, so we can't just say, oh, well, we'll just protect the areas where we know there's biogenic habitat structure. We know very little about what's living on the seabed. On the land, you can use satellites and remote sensing to understand where trees and things grow you can't really do that very easily in the marine environment. So we use this rules-based principles approach. And what we did essentially is <clears throat> we had some basic physical data. So we know about the depth 
and we know about the substrate types, and we know a little bit about the current flows um, through some of these areas. And what we did is we created a series of rules related to those physical spatial layers that we had, so to try to predict where biogenic habitat structure would occur. So for example, um, we predict that biogenic habitat structure will be greatest in the shallow areas and relatively scarce down deep, primarily because some of the algae and the kelps, which are primary structure formers, um, require light, and so they're going to be up in the shallow zone. Substrate type, equally, um, a lot of the structure forming organisms require a substrate to attach to, and so they're more likely to be found in rocky substrates relative to sand or to mud. And currents um, relate to these because many of the structure forming organisms are suspension feeding animals. They sit in one place and they filter water as it flows past, so currents are bringing them their nutrition. Same for the, the algae, the currents are bringing them the nutrients. So in areas where there's high current, you tend to get more of the biogenic structure. So based on these simple rules and the physical data layers, the depth, the substrate type, we predicted uh, where we'd expect high biogenic structure. And you can see this map is not um, quantitative per se, it's sort of semi-quantitative, but we're predicting areas with relatively higher versus relatively lower levels of biogenic structure. So the dark colors are the areas with, where we predict hot, more biogenic habitat structure to, to be present. <clears throat> so having a map is great, but you, or a model is great, but you need to make sure it has some basis in reality. And so we went out to validate this map or to validate the technique effectively. And what we did is we went to a place that's a bit um, out in the middle of the Hauraki Gulf called uh, Eotea Great Barrier Island. And we visited uh, almost 60 sites spread right around the island. And we were conscious to visit places that where we predicted very high levels of biogenic structure versus areas that had lower levels of biogenic structure. And at each of these sites, we um, dropped a camera down to the seabed and drifted for, you know, 100 meters or so. And we tried to characterize what was on the seabed to rank whether the, the biogenic habitat structure was, was relatively low um, versus relatively high. And we saw some phenomenal areas with big sponge gardens or big um, kelp forests and different things like that. I think the, the good news is that um, the empirical observations, so the, 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 the amount of structure that we have observed on the video data matched pretty well with what we predicted using this very simple rules-based, um, principles-based technique. So you can see that there's some overlap, but basically the areas that we thought were going to really have high biogenic structure, we predicted to have high biogenic structure, by and large did, and the areas that were low were low, we can at least rank high, medium, and low. So that was, that was kind of a win, I'd say. Now, one thing to realize about the maps is that the maps are really um, showing where the, the, the potential for biogenic habitat structure to, to be, um, be present. So we, we might predict the biogenic habitat structure to be high in a certain area, but if a, a trawler has come through and wiped it all out, we won't find it there when we put the camera down. Similarly, if the area is, is, is subjected to chronic sedimentation, we might not see some of these structure forming organisms present on the seabed. So these maps are really about where we expect the biogenic habitat structure to be and we, we, without disturbance. I think on the flip side also is that it's also areas where if we protect the seabed from some of these disturbances or reduce the amount of disturbance, either from trawling or sedimentation or what have you, these are areas where we'd expect the biogenic habitat structure to, to emerge and recover if it were left alone. So we get more of these um, corals or horse mussels or anemones or different types of things. So, so these are the final, um, this is the final biogenic habitat structure map that we created for the Hauraki Gulf. Um, and we've also made a map for the upper South Island. Um, and we did some validation work down there. So again, every time you produce a new map, 
it's probably a, a very good idea to ground truth it and validate it uh, to the greatest extent possible. Um, and then zooming in on Queen Charlotte Sound, um, Donna Clark especially has helped put together a map here. And there's also new um, bathymetric data and new sediment data um, that NIWA has done it, um, recently in conjunction with um, Land Information New Zealand to, to better map this. So we can actually maybe improve these layers um, iteratively over time because once the base data is better, the predictions should in theory be better. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna show, this is a bit of a video just to convince you um, that there, there is, uh, there are some of these biogenic reefs and some of this biogenic structure. So this is an area in the middle of Queen Charlotte Sound. Hopefully you can't hear the scuba diver breathing. I'll just remove that. Um, so th this is a reef formed by um, serpulid polychaete worms. And they're the calcareous tube forming polychaetes and they create these colonies that go almost a meter above the seabed. Um, and you can see that they host a whole variety of fish life. Um, and a variety of invertebrates as well. You'll see anemones on here, you'll see some brachiopods, some bryozoans, all sorts of different things. Um, you can see that the current is, is hooning past, um, and, but they do shelter a whole bunch of different species. And it's, it's, this is sort of one of the closest things to a coral reef that I've seen in New Zealand. Look at the little fish right there hiding out. So pretty cool. Okay, so now I'm going to move along um, and talk about something a little bit different. Um, this is moving on to a different service. And this is about an environmental problem that's uh, on the increase in some parts of New Zealand and is also very problematic in many other parts of the world. So the, we have uh, excess nutrient loading uh, from land into our estuaries and it's becoming an increasing problem in many places. So with sewage or fertilizers on the land or dairying, some of those nutrients get into the waterways and end up in the estuaries, or they leach down through the, the soils and enter the groundwater. Either way, they end up in the estuaries, and you get these um, nuisance macroalgal outbreaks, and they can result in very gooey, smelly uh, sediments that have low amenity value and very low biodiversity. The problems can actually extend out to the coast as well. So some of our beaches are starting to get covered with, um, in this case, this is ulva that's kind of drifted up, detached and drifted up all along the beaches. And it's all throughout the surf line. So again, your experience of enjoying the beach or swimming in the water would be affected by this service or by nitrogen loading. So there are natural processes that remove nitrogen and we're focusing on these as key ecosystem services that are trying to, that are acting to ameliorate or fix some of these problems, counteract them. So denitrification is, is a process that's central to this nitrogen removal ecosystem service. Um, denitrification is a classic um, nitty gritty process that most people don't understand or want to understand. Um, it's microbially mediated and it's very complicated, but it's very important to things that people do actually care about, which is having nice firm sandy sand flats or beaches that are free from this nuisance macroalgae. So what denitrification is really, it's the biological or biologically mediated conversion of nitrate into elemental nitrogen. So the key thing here is that nitrate is bioavailable so it can be taken up and used by macroalgae or plants and create these nuisance blooms whereas elemental nitrogen is relatively bioinert it's the stuff that's in the air we breathe um, it kind of off gases and it's removed from this loop so denitrification is a very important process so <clears throat> here um, rather than using a rules-based approach to mapping um, ecosystem services we used a data-based approach. And, and the best available data uh, in this case, um, relevant to us was from Emily Douglas's PhD research, which included 118 measurements of something called DEA, which is a denitrification enzyme um, activity. 
So it's not actually a measure of denitrification rate. Uh, it's, it's a proxy for denitrification that's a little bit easier and cheaper to measure. And so she measured DEA um, at, at 118 different places. And for each measurement of DEA, she also collected some um, complementary environmental data. And by looking at the combinations of environmental data, uh, we're able to build a model to predict DEA. And so essentially, that, that these data that Emily collected are the basis for the development of these models. <clears throat> so the cool thing is that once we've developed this relationship between the combinations of environmental predictors and DEA, we can actually use it to predict DEA in certain places. So we've got for example, in Woodford Estuary, we had very good spatial information on the, in, these environmental variables, but we had never measured DEA in this location. So, but this is the, the beauty of the, the tool that we've um, created. So what we've done is that we've, um, so these are the spatial layers of the environmental data. So these are all the, each individual data points for the sediments mud content the sediments organic matter content, and the sediments chlorophyll A content. And we can interpolate out from the, the data um, points um, to create these continuous spatial maps. And using this existing spatial sediment data, we use it with our model, and we predict DEA in this new place, Whitford environment, Whitford environment, where we've never measured DEA before. <clears throat> so here is the DEA um, map prediction. And you can see that the, there's low levels of DEA are, are in blue, and the higher levels of de, uh, this denitrification enzyme activity are in, in red. Um, one of the important uh, values of the techniques that we're using is that they also allow us to estimate uncertainty in our predictions. So in other words, there are parts of the map where we're relatively confident in our predictions. So those are the blue areas. And there's parts of the map where we're less confident in our predictions. Those are the red areas. So it's actually really important to know which uh, parts of the map are uh, more or less reliable from a management standpoint, particularly if you're having to choose among areas that you want to protect. So another thing to remember, though, is that this is predicted DEA. DEA had never been actually measured in Whitford before. So again, validation is very important. So we went out to, the, to Whitford again in 2017, I think, 2018. Um, these are the original data that um, we used to create those environmental data layers and build up the model. And then all the black triangles are the uh, areas um, where we collected new DEA information in order to see how well our predictions matched up. <clears throat> so you can see that our predictions of DEA are pretty well correlated with what we measured in terms of DEA. So that's pretty good. If it was a perfect correlation between what we measured and what we predicted, all the data points would fall along this red one-to-one -one line. You can see that some of the data points that we measured fall below that or above that. But overall, there's a significant positive correlation, and they're pretty well correlated, pretty strongly correlated. So that, that's a good result. So here's the, the finalized um, DEA map that we created. Um, it's been validated. And also, there's two different types of uncertainty information available with these maps. I haven't shown them on this slide, but uh, I talked about prediction uncertainty. You can also um, evaluate uncertainty in terms of the environmental coverage. The more data points you have um, in a certain area, the more confident you're going to be in your predictions. Another thing we did is that we actually updated the model. So all of the new um, DEA measurements that we made in Whitford, we actually incorporated into the model so that we can improve it and use it for predictions elsewhere. Um, just also note that these are the empirical values on the same scale overlaid on top of the predicted values. So again, you can see spatially, we did a pretty good job at predicting. Um, the final thing, I guess, uh, to remember about this map is that it's not a map of the nutrient or nitrogen removal service. It's a map of DEA predicted. Um, 
we need to work a little bit more on the robustness of DEA as a proxy for denitrification and how well it links to the nutrient removal service. <clears throat> so uh, final thing, I'm going to talk about bivalves again. Um, so essentially what um, Vera Rulins did is that she took this large list of uh, ecosystem services that were associated with shellfish and she had um, identified sort of four sort of themes or bundles of ecosystem services. And um, so she also, so these are the four sort of themes. So marine resources, so providing food or provision of materials like the crushed shell material that I talked about, or the bundles that are related to coastal health and, and quality. So water quality, nutrient removal services, things like that. She also identified for each of these bundles, she identified these links between the processes that underpin them and the functions, functions and eventually the, the services. So another point really is that the levels of ecosystem functioning and service delivery really depend on the densities of the shellfish. Um, so for example, if you have greater numbers of, of, of cockles or mussels, you're going to get more filtration and more improvements to water quality. But the key point is that we can manipulate densities and measure their effects on levels of functioning. So we can actually build up some pretty good information on, on quantifying this, the services provided by shellfish. As I mentioned, density is really key though. We really need to understand the spatial distribution of the shellfish that are associated with these ecosystem services. And the first step really is, is mapping the occurrence and importantly, the density of these uh, key shellfish species across estuaries. So here's an example showing uh, a map of um, the pr predicted uh, density of pippies. And here's a second shellfish species, cockles, uh, in Tauranga Harbor. <clears throat> these two shellfish species are ecologically and culturally important. And you can see that they've actually got both, they've got quite di distinct um, distributions. The pippi are basically found in subtidal channels um, and they live submerged underneath the water regardless of the state of the tide. Whereas the cockles, um, they basically occur throughout the entire estuary, but you can see there's areas where they're more common um, and they're pretty much confined to intertidal areas. So th this is the first step. Essentially what Vera is gonna do next is connect this up to her work on the relationships between bivalve densities and how that affects function and ultimately ecosystem services. So just to wrap up, um, what I've shown you today is that we've developed mul multiple methods for um, quantifying ecosystem services. We've produced validated maps um, with associated uncertainty information um, and we've made these available for managers to utilize. Um, I do think there's a little bit more work we need to do on converting some of the proxy measurements to actual ecosystem services. So for example, DEA and how that links to denitrification and nitrogen removal, um, and also how the, the densities of the shellfish um, relate to specific levels of ecosystem service delivery. Um, I think it's definitely true that measuring and mapping of cultural services, for example, associated with shellfish or kaimoana or, or other things, that's definitely a gap area. It's been highly overlooked in the scientific literature for sure. Um, ecosystem services are a very uh, important means for uh, measuring restoration success and for improving spatial management. And I think importantly, they help us uh, communicate um, more about the benefits or the full, more full accounting of the benefits of marine biodiversity and how it contributes to the health and functioning of our marine systems. So that concludes my talk and um, I'm happy to take a few questions and answers. I think what I'm supposed to do is to escape out from my slides so that I can see your, your um, questions. There you are, Drew. Cool.
All right, thank you so much for that presentation. I We've had one question come through during the presentation and it was to, from Joshua Sargent. Mm -hmm. And he asks, is there, an, is there an associated publication related to the ecosystem principles approach, the rules-based spatial analysis for the uh, biogenic habitat provision research? Yep. So um, Mike Townsend will get mad at me for not knowing them off the top of my head, but we've, there's basically three papers that have come out. The first was a general one on the ecosystem principles approach. So if you search for Townsend et al. I think it's 2011. Uh, you could also search for my name. I'm a co-author. There's another paper in um, 2014 where we, um, again, similar authors. Uh, and then we validated the, the map. So the stuff I showed around Great Barrier Island and the validation of the biogenic habitat technique, that's Townsend and Lohrer 2019. So all those, I think um, Charlotte has uh, on the Sustainable Seas webpage and even maybe associated with the talk invite, uh, you'll be able to find links to those papers. So yeah, and in fact, many of the maps that I showed are also available um, through the Sustainable Seas website as, a, as products of, of the research that we conducted. Absolutely, and I am just sending through that link to everyone in the chat now. And uh, when I do a summary email out to everyone, I will share the link to that web page where you can download the maps and look at the other associated tools and resources. All right. Well, does so? Does anyone have any questions? Now's the an opportunity. Uh, kia ora. My name's Helen Kettles. I've got a question for you, Drew. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I'm a yep, disembodied yep. voice coming through to you. That's fine. Through the line. <laughs> um, I've got a question about the denitrification uh, part of your talk. Yep. Um, nutrient removal service. And it's, it sounds, it is handy to know how mud and nutrients and the like are going to be able to affect that because then you can actually manage the estuaries in part for kind of getting rid of the nitrogen, the nitrate. Nitri denitrification is a kind of a, you know, it's a, of course you know it's a two-step process that goes from nitrate to nitrous oxide and then through to the nitrogen gas. And the nitrogen gas is um, harmless, but the nitrous oxide where incomplete denitrification occurs is a very toxic greenhouse gas. So I'm wondering whether how, when you measure the enzyme, whether you've got any idea about whether it's producing the inert gas versus the toxic greenhouse gas. So how, how complete that denitrification process is, whether the assay gives you any clues about that. Yeah, um, so the assay itself won't give you any information on that. <clears throat> actually what the assay does, and, and Emily D Douglas is the expert on this, but the assay actually blocks the final step that goes to, from N2O to N2 gas and you measure the N2O as a way of estimating how much uh, enzyme activity there is. So it won't get at your question directly. Um, and the other thing I think um, DEA is probably a very good proxy for the microbes, the denitrifying microbes and their abundance, but it may not accurately reflect denitrification rate because the macrofauna and other things that um, move the water around, sub, you know, solutes and stuff, um, those are quite important. So we definitely need to do a bit of work um, to make sure that DEA, um, DEA may be useful for predicting this service, but it may not represent the nutrient removal service itself yet. Hopefully that answers your question. Great, thank you. All right, uh, thanks, Drew. Next question from Rebecca. Has much thought gone into valuing slash monetizing these ecosystem services? Uh, yes, um, there's been a lot of thought gone into it. And in fact, there's sort of two camps. Um, some people are proponents of trying to monetize everything because if 
if there's if it's not monetized, the economists can ignore it effectively. Um, but then there's other people who really disagree with the idea of putting value, uh, economic dollar value on aesthetics or cultural importance or things of that nature. Those things are quite, it's difficult to quantify. It's like trying to quantify, um, you know, in dollar terms, how much you love your children or something. It, it's, it's, it's a tricky one, eh? Okay, and the next question we have is from Steve Ehrlich. Kia ora, Juru, congratulations to you and your team on the great work. It strikes me that the subtitle biogenic predictive models with appropriate validation could be a relatively cost-effective approach to informing marine spatial planning, particularly as a first cut. What caveats would you put on that? <clears throat> um, well, I, I agree that they could and should be used um, in marine spatial planning. And in fact, that was the impetus for developing the, the, the models, the, the maps for the Hauraki Gulf in the first place. Um, they're being used as part of that sea change spatial planning process. So these layers of biogenic structure or um, services could be used along with other types of layers about uses and values. So, um, but I think again, um, caveats, in terms of some of the model predictions can be wrong because some of the underlying base data is, long, is wrong. So we assume that um, the, the information we have, for example, on seabed sediments is correct. But sometimes when we went out to, with the camera, we found that it was actually different to what was um, you know, the base data. So, <clears throat> There's a little bit more validation to do, I think, but overall, um, we have a pretty good degree of certainty about um, the strengths and limitations of the technique. I, I definitely think, at, as Steve mentioned, as a cost effective method, and in the absence of other data, some information is better than in nothing, particularly if you can explain the limitations of those data and the uncertainty surrounding them. And I think that's really what we've been trying to do is not just produce maps that people might just believe wholeheartedly. We're trying to produce maps and say, well, it's validated here, it's not validated here, or um, you know, there's uncertainty in this area and there's not uncertainty in this other area. Great. Thank you, Drew. And actually, I have a question for you um, that is kind of linked to what you were just talking about. Especially with your DEA maps, there was a lot of emphasis on measuring uncertainty, and you've just you've kind of mentioned that now. Doesn't that confuse things? Um, no, I, I think to the contrary, it's it's pretty important in management, and there's ways of handling uncertainty, <clears throat> um, and I guess it's about um, when you, you uh, there's limited resources, you can't protect everywhere. Managers are going to have to choose where to protect. If you are trying to protect an area um, that has high ecosystem service delivery um, and you're really highly confident in that, in that value, that's, that's a good thing. The problem comes is when you might have um, Low, you're predicting low ecosystem service delivery, but you're not very confident in that value, in that prediction. That means that potentially you could skip protecting it, but because you're not confident, it might actually be a really important area. So this is, this is the kind of game, the balance that you have to play. And if you don't have the information, you're blind. But if you do have the information, you can make informed choices about what to protect and what not to protect. Awesome, thanks Drew. Does anyone else have any questions for Drew? Is anyone typing away quickly or? <laughs> or no? Oh, and we have one from Kath Wallace. Drew, can you, I'll read it out. Mm -hmm. Um, 
do we need to approach the use of ecosystem services as a qualitatively different and interlinked systems decision making process? Looks like there's a couple of questions, so I'll just read out that first one. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, the, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. I think ecosystem services is different. It's a, it's a communication tool in some ways. Um, but I think what we're trying to do is making sure that we can um, quantify it where we can and make it more usable as a practical management tool. Um, I think it, it is part of a, an interlinked decision making process. Um, but I guess the, oh, the, the Sorry, Drew, I have made a mistake and I didn't read out the full question. So yeah. um, I'll start again. Sorry, Kath. <laughs> Do we need to approach the use of ecosystem services as a qualitatively different and interlinked systems decision making process? Ecosystems are functionally linked, so it makes no sense to use a model, just use a model, just use a human utility model that suggests we can substitute between, between and trade off functions. We economists call these biophysical constraints and values as non tradables. It is not helpful to create a tr trade-off system if, in fact, there are non-substitutables. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how I answer that one. Um, I, I think it's important to, to uh, at least recognize all the different values that are associated with the marine systems. Um, I'm not necessarily in favor of trading off one for another. But um, in effect, that is what we're doing already. When people uh, operate in the marine environment and do certain things, it does impinge on other ecosystem services and other um, biodiversity values. So I think that's, that's the important thing is to um, get a greater appreciation and recognition of the full range of, of values and services that the, that the biodiversity provides. Otherwise, again, um, we're, we're making trade-offs, but we're not really realizing what we're trading off. Hopefully I got the, the gist of her question. Yeah. Kath, did that answer your question? Uh, generally speaking, yes, but I think it leaves the problem on the table. Um, which is as soon as you disaggregate and then see things as substitutable, you, you don't actually force um, decision makers to see biophysical constraints. They start seeing things as trade-offs. I take Drew's point that we are doing that in a blind way anyway. But I think it's really important that we say, no, look, there are some things that can't just be sacrificed um, for economic purposes or whatever else, if it actually disrupts and uh, significantly disturbs the biophysical processes, like, say, the climate, ocean interaction or whatever else. Mm -hmm. But there is another question I have, and that is, it's great seeing the science and seeing the work showing density, but in the real world, the next thing you'll find is that people are rushed in there to harvest it all, uh, where there's the greatest concentration. So your information starts to feed into a pretty unhealthy kind of dynamic. Mm. So I wonder if Drew could um, address that one too, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I guess again, I think it's pretty hard to manage um, for ecosystem functions and ecosystem services if you don't know where they're being produced and where you're being delivered. Again, you're not going to be able to protect everywhere. You're going to have to make choices about where you protect. And so we want to do that in the most wise and scientifically based way that we can. That, that, that's all we can do. Um, and if the information is sensitive, I mean, we, we wouldn't necessarily release um, information about, you know, this awesome scallop bed or something so that people can zoom in on it. 
Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there is the potential for abuse of the system, but um, yeah, I think you, you have to know where services are being, um, you have to know where services are being produced if you're gonna protect them. All right, thank you, Drew. All right, so if we have no more questions, I think we can wrap up. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to Drew. I know you had a big team behind you and I, I appreciate that you gave them shout outs during your presentation as well. So thank you for doing that. Um, just a quick reminder that this webinar has been recorded, so we will upload it onto YouTube tomorrow and send around send it around the link to that around at the end. Thank you all for being here, and I hope you have a great day. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>